Welcome back, everybody, to the Investors Roundtable. I'm your host, Robert Kraft. You can follow me on Twitter, at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. And we have a jam-packed episode for you today. You know, I think I, I joked offline, I think we might just rename this the Contrarian Podcast because this one, this topic got overwhelming, like, I got to be on, let's do this. And we got an all-star crew today. Many people, some of my favorite people here, you know, of course, mine is Kevin Shea. We, you know, we, we love Kevin, but we, we maxed out before you said yes. Uh, so uh, joining us today, we got Paul Andriola from Small Cap Discoveries, Jason Hirschman at 8-Track. Uh, I always mess up your Twitter handle. It's at 8-Track. 8-Track 180. 8-Track 180. 8-Track 180. I always think it's 18 for some reason. Maybe it's my- It my used Jewish. to be. It used to be. Yes. My, my Jewishness wants to go is eight, it's eight track high, but like, okay, eight, eight track 180. <laughs> but uh, we got Christian Reiter here as well from Korean Capital. What's up, Christian? And <laughs> Steve, and Stephen Keel from Arquitos Capital, the, the, our, the anchor of the Investors Roundtable. So uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. What's going on? Hey, Bobby. Happy to be here. All right. Well, so we had a request from the fellow West Coast crew that they wanted to take a minute before uh, they didn't want to be going. I, I, I'm specifically looking at Jason, not Paul. Paul was like, you can throw to me first, no problem. I can talk for 15 minutes, it's all good. But uh, I, I, you know, the topic today, as I, I said at the beginning was uh, contrarianism, you know, and talking about the mindset of it and how, you know, it's, it, we talked about it on this podcast, on Planet Microcap and here many times. And it's something that in theory, you're like, oh, this, I could be a contrarian. This is easier said than done. No problem. Just do the opposite of what everyone else is doing. Easy. Yeah, not so easy. So I figured we'd get into that. So Stephen, you want to kick us off with your thoughts on uh, contrarianism? Yeah, well, I mean, first you have to figure out what everyone else is thinking. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah <exactly>. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's not the easiest thing in the world, especially yeah. in this environment where a lot of the news self-selects to you <laughs> and to uh, you know your followers and your preferred news outlet and the people you surround yourself with and things like that. It's very difficult. Uh, I will say prior to launching the fund, I was an attorney and one of the things you know they try to teach us to varying degrees of success is to be able to argue the other person's position as well as you can argue your own. And that's a valuable tool to have, but again, you know, it's easier said than done. And so I, I think, you know, for me to kind of kick off this discussion, I, I think you have to work through the challenges of making sure that you understand what consensus is. And that means broadening your perspective, broadening the people you follow, uh, the news and information you follow, uh, and being kind of intellectually honest uh, about, um, you know, what, what, your, what information you're taking in every day, and you almost need to seek out information that you're otherwise may not even be interested in. Uh, and then, you know, when, once you're able to get some semblance of that, then you can apply, you know, maybe part of your contrarianism slash pain in the ass part of your personality. Absolutely. So by the way, real quick, we uh, also joining us today is Gary Reeby, you know, host, co-host of In the Market Trenches with Gary Reeby and Eric Fury. Gary, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, you, we just kicked it off with Stephen with understanding contrarianism and how, and he makes a really good point here is that um, you got to understand what the other side and what the consensus is right now. You know, so I, I think that's a, a great, great rabbit hole we should kind of go down a little bit more too. So um, Gary, before I get to you, let's now we're going to go West Coast. All right, Paul, you know, what's what, what what's your thoughts on that? You know, is how have you been able to start thinking about, well, what is the consensus thinking here? And how can I maybe find an opportunity that goes against that? You, you know, and I, I take a slightly different uh, view of contrarianism, or at least the, the way I, I uh, you know, put it in effect is I, I try to go where investors aren't there right so i try to go sort of where stories are not discovered yet rather than try to find something that's been beaten up or thrown away or you know a lot of people have looked at it already and and uh, go against the flow there i'm really trying to find stuff before everybody else does or before there is a consensus or there is 
uh, you know, uh, discovery. So it, it's a little bit different. And I think, you know, the tools that we have at hand today are very different than what would, would have been available, you know, 20 years ago. Um, you know, the internet, right? And, and different uh, sort of forms of chatter and bulletin boards and just, you know, a little bit more um, uh, population of different places that are talking about a stock. So when, when, what I, what I like to do is because I'm a bottom up approach type of guy, I'm looking for, for stories that, um, that I can somewhat validate whether they're discovered or not, by how many people are talking about it. Right. And then, and then try to really break down sort of the ecosystem. So if there's some people talking about a stock, you know, how big is that ecosystem? Is it, is it 10 people that are all talking about it and that's it, that's all that knows about it. Or is it, uh, you know, is it a hundred? Or is it a thousand? And and who are these people? And how qualified are they? And all these things. So it, it's a little bit less than saying, okay, this stock is real beaten up, and you know, it's it's out of favor, and 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 those sort of aspects. It's more, look, nobody knows about this thing. I'm I'm to the table first, right? So that, that's that's sort of what I look for, and and how I view contrarianism, especially in the nano cap space, right? Um, you know, you're looking for things like you, you want you want to find stuff before the funds find them, before the institutional guys find them, before analysts find them, all that sort of stuff. That's to me, it's that that's that's my sort of take on contrarianism in, in this space. Yeah, Paul, you definitely are like I I want to go somewhere. I, I mean, just in your in your history, you know, you tend to look for nano caps literally where there is nobody. <laughs> yeah, you tend you tend you tend you tend to be one of the first, if if not the first, when you're looking at some of those names. Um, so, so, so Christian, I want to throw to you then, you know, what, how, how do you think about contrarianism? I, I think we're each going to identify or, or define contrarianism, like in our own particular ways. Um, uh, I would say that it, it, what, what both Stephen and Paul have said is that it's not popular. Um, you're going for something that popular people either don't even know exists or they say that it's trash. Um, or that it's played out or whatever. They have an opinion, the popular view is A, and you're gonna say A is not true, um, or you know, B is the way to go with this. Um, so I think that for me, like I've got something genetic or behavioral in me that very occasionally wants to be like, no, y'all are wrong and I can figure this out better than you. Um, and I think that, that that has to be like, something in you that that comes out very occasionally like I mean 99% of the time plus you're going to want to do what everybody else is doing and believing like we're going to believe that we're actually on a video call and this is not like a video game that an AI computer is like created all of you and I'm the only real person here and <laughs> no, no, like you gotta you can't accomplish life if you think that if you question everything um, but I think that in the stock market if you can identify something where everybody else is wrong, either because they haven't paid attention to it yet, and they should be, um, or that they think that this story is X when X has changed, and now it's actually becoming something very good. Um, you can make a lot of money. And that's why you care about this stuff. Like you can find something before other people pick up on it, or before an activist takes, like gets involved, or before another company buys it out and like, gets you from popular view is wrong to money in your pocket because there has to be some path for that. Um, and so that's, I don't know, those are my, my quick beliefs, my thoughts on it. Um, I think you always want to have evidence that your view is correct and the popular view is wrong. So it's, if it's undiscovered, you want to see in the numbers or in something there that it's actually developing into something amazing. Um, and if it's, unpopular and people think it's a trash business, you want to have some evidence in the numbers that's like, I'm not just saying everybody's wrong and I'm right because I'm some sort of smart genius here, uh, but I've actually got numbers and evidence to back it up. So I think that's, no, no, those are my quick thoughts on contrarianism and what you're looking for if you want to make some money out of it. Very good. Look, there are some people here that I feel like they're like, damn, why did I take the red pill on that stock thinking I'm such a genius? All right. You know, so thinking that we could be living in an alternate reality. But hey, that's that's part of the learning lessons. So, all right. So I'm going to throw it to Jason. Now, Jason, what's what's your how do you how do you define contrarianism? First of all, I want to say that you don't want to be George Costanza and just define contrarianism as 
the opposite, right? Unless you're George Constanza, then you can be the opposite. But if the rest of us just can't say, you know, just do the opposite, right? It's, it's about seeing different insights, hopefully better insights because you're doing different research. And in, uh, uh, I'm gonna mention something a little bit strange, but I'll, I'll tie it back into contrarianism. Uh, you know, I'm a Golden Knights fan. Last night I was at the game, right? Where Montreal won three to two. And, and uh, I was actually sitting next to six friends of Kerry Price, the Montreal goalie, who are from Seattle. This is the first time they could see him, right? Because the you know, Canadians have been playing all Canadians. Uh, and you know, the joy that they experienced at their friend's success blunted you know, the disappointment I felt, much of the disappointment I felt at the loss that the Golden Knights experienced last night. And really, I mean, how do you, part of, it, of being a contrarian is getting different information, different stimulus. So you have a different emotional and different intellectual response. And that's just an example of being a contrarian, but not in, you know, let's say investing, just in, in life, right? I was happy for them. I felt something different. I didn't feel as bad about what was going on, even though I was in a crowd in the Golden Knights fan, because I had a very different experience of sitting next to these fans who were just joyous at their friend's success. So I think, you know, in, in some ways you have to, you have to seek out different information uh, in order to really program yourself differently. And that's what part of being a good contrarian is. I can relate to that so well in that I remember when the Giants were playing the Patriots in the 07 Super Bowl, where I'm a Giants fan. I wanted to see the Giants win, but my OCD and the popular opinion is like, it'd be really cool to see a perfect season. So like part of me was kind of rooting for that. And at the, but at the same time, you know, I was going the unpopular side of like, I would really, I, I want the Giants to win. But you're, Maybe you're overall happy the Giants won, right? I mean, the, the, 100%. The, yeah. 100%. Okay. And now I got the joy of being able to cheer for Brady when he was on the Bucks to beat the, the Chiefs, you know, because like, hey, you never, hey, we beat him twice. Like, I don't care, you know, so, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so no, that's a, that's a really good story that Jason. So, yeah, let, so, okay, we're going to close out with Gary and then we'll keep, we'll open forum it up to see how we can, you know, find, talk even further down some of these rabbit holes. So Gary, how about you? You know, what, what, how do you define it? Oh, I mean, I miss. I guess part of what Steven said. So if any of this overlaps with what he said, I, I apologize. But so as I reflect on what others have said, um, you know, I sort of distinguish contrarianism versus investing in the obscure. I kind of think about them as two different things. Um, and also contrarianism, like in my, in my mind is just taking an opinion that's different than the consensus. And that could be right, that could be wrong. Um, I would say that some some of the other comments alluded to this, but I think the sort of the null hypothesis whenever you're looking at something is that the market has it right. And then you have to go about disproving that. And, um, you know, I had to learn this because I'm just a sort of disagree. Like, I think contrarianism is not something that you're necessarily, you can necessarily learn. It's more or less something that is like an innate personality characteristic. It's something you're more or less born with. It's like it, it, you take personality tests, there's a, there's a factor called agreeableness. And like, I'm just a disagreeable bastard. And like, <laughs> and, and like, I just am, that's my nature. Like, and I have to temp, I have to actively work to temper that down. And I have to act, just when I look at something, accept and say, the market has it right, unless I can prove it wrong. And then I have to sort of go about proving that wrong. If, as we're, if we're talking strictly about contrarianism, if we're talking about, you know, investing in the obscure, finding something first, I think that's a different matter entirely because you're one of, a sort of an exercise in being an expert rock flipper and then knowing what it is when you've turned over the rock. And just by the nature of so few people looking at it, you're, you're likely to have an opinion that's different or you, I, I shouldn't say, even say different, just unique because it's the only opinion, right? Or one of three opinions. Um, and I think the, the, what, what it comes back down to ultimately is just the ability to think independently. So I, I jotted down a few notes as people were talking. Mm -hmm. And uh, my notes here are contrarianism versus investing in the obscure versus thinking independently. And I just think that the most important thing is thinking independently, but recognizing more often than not, the market's got it right. And so, um, you know, in my business, people try to sell me stuff all the time. And the stuff that's easiest to sell is probably the stuff that's the most dangerous. And it, because it's like obvious to a salesperson that this is something I can go sell to a, you know, somebody who's not well-educated. And you really, really have to think independently. And 
um, you know, thinking independently and being contrarian, they're, thinking independently is necessary to thinking contrarian and thinking correctly in a contrarian way. Um, but what you got to be very careful of is that you don't get drawn down holes where more often than not the market has it right and you're just, you know, stepping on a landmine that you didn't know was there. Um, and so that's sort of, as I reflected on the comments that I heard, I missed all of Stephen. Stephen, I apologize. I'm sure they were wonderful comments. And if I, if I aped some of yours, it was unintentional. Um, but that, that's sort of, as I think about this and reflect on it, sort of my, my take on the matter. Yeah, don't let it happen again, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, Bobby, I'll, I'll add something to what Gary said because I've actually been jotting down notes as well, and the word "independent" was uh, was one of the things I did. Um, the it, it's important to be able to think independently, but I think the other the other thing that that's all part of this is that we and we all I think on this panel have a, a slightly different strategy to the same end goal, right? So you have to have a, a valuation approach or a strategy that you believe in. Uh, that allows you to have that independent sort of uh, belief that what you're finding has real value, right? So I, I think ultimately it's finding a mechanism to determine what that value is and believing in that independent uh, sort of uh, thought process that you have. Um, that's what I think works is, um, and, and it's contrarian in a way because I think the majority of investors that are out there don't uh, rely on themselves and don't have that independent view. So if, if you can build that, I think there's a lot of strategies around, uh, around this uh, business that allows you to be you know, more successful. Um, and, and you know, again, just, just being independent alone or having that, that approach and being disciplined is contrarian to what most, of, most investors are doing. Right. So. I, I would agree with that. I would just also ask Strict and say it's not ne it's it's necessary to think independently, but it's not sufficient because you also have to think correctly. And so it's also an exercise in building your skill sets and your expertise and your circle, sort of your circle of competence to know that you're thinking correctly about a matter that everybody thinks something different about. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I, I I sort of as I thought of what you were saying there, I, I I stopped short of what's really important is not only being independent but being correct. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, completely I, I know that that yeah. sounds obvious, but I, I don't know that that's always obvious because I always think about ways to sort of improve my thought process, improve my diligence process. And I, you know, I do things like keep logs and journals of stuff that I do. And that way I don't go back after the fact and say, you know, we bought X, Y, and Z stock for reasons A, B, and C. It worked out, but like it wasn't for a reason that I bought it. Like I was just kind of like, that's kind of dumb luck, but like, mm -hmm. If th when things don't work out, it gives you an opportunity to improve the process to think more correctly the next time, and you sort of build this this, this resource set um, that help you think more cor more correctly in the future. Because independent isn't enough if you're if you're wrong. So, I would I would add also that that you know, I think people are are better at being contrarian or applying contrarian to say processes to the buy decision, uh, but a lot of people who are I would say very good at being contrarian at, at buying, aren't as good about the holding decision or the selling decision, which I think you also should apply some contrarian approach, right? So they, they start off as being contrarian and then they become more consensus uh, over time and they end up losing out. I mean, a lot of, you know, people can have very different returns by, even though they own the same stock, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's important to, to apply some kind of contrarian approach and we can all, slightly disagree with that, you know, what that, that is uh, throughout the entire process, uh, buying, holding, and selling. Yeah, completely agree. I should, I should point out that not necessarily taking a, a consensus approach doesn't necessarily, it's not, it's not a ticket toward, toward losing money, like necessarily or whatever. Like you could take a consensus point of view and be right and still make money. So like if you take it, like, like look at the, the tech stocks, for instance, like the consensus view is, has for the last decade has been that these are great businesses and they've more or less yeah. delivered on that and more and that's been correct and it's been a home run right like so like you don't need i guess the takeaway is also you don't necessarily you don't necessarily need to be contrarian to make money a lot of us tend to be that way but it's yeah, not, yeah, it's I, not I, I you're, you're being a little picky about the language Gary. but what i was trying to say you know i mean yeah yeah i mean, I mean contrary you know you, you you can't be you got to be right in the end, right? Yes. You got to be right, uh, and sometimes the consensus is right. A lot of times the market is right, right? So you got to be selectively, you know, seeing seeing. Not everything is always going to be different from what the uh, uh, the market projects. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, my, the point is, like, just because something becomes consensus, like, let's say you bought something that's had a, like, you had a home run trade that was well out of consensus. You had a differentiated point of view, and, like, you did a lot of work that, like, you, you did really well on that trade, and now it's sort of become a consensus long idea. You know, at what point do you, how do you manage that, right? Like, yeah. I mean, like, it's, 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 it, if, if you sell it the first sign of it being sort of consensus, you, you miss out on a lot of the rest of it, right? You, like, because you, you could say that became a consensus long idea, I don't know, 100% ago or something, right? You know, so it's hard, is my point. It's like, it's not necessarily just because something cons becomes consensus doesn't, it, like, you know, to, but to your original point, knowing what to do when that happens is really, really hard. That's, uh, that's, that's actually much harder than just being contrarian and being right a lot of the times. Well, what, what some of you guys have said that, uh, that I really like is that if what Paul started with, like, if you have a strategy that makes sense and that you have expertise in because you've been working on it for so long, that gives you the confidence to make an independent decision and come up with independent thought. And sometimes that will be contrarian and sometimes it will just be right when it's consensus. But that also allows you to, you know, you know how to hoe your row or whatever like that. You know how to do your strategy. And so you're looking for specific pieces of information and specific pieces of evidence that support or refute your, your hypotheses about this stock. And so what you might buy as a contrarian or as a, I'm the first one to find this thing, you continue to follow your strategy and your process that you, you know, and maybe it becomes consensus, maybe it stops being contrarian, maybe it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> but as long as you continue to follow that strategy and use the disparate pieces of evidence um, that you find that aren't just like how many other people like this, do I have social proof on this, but you're getting like real information that allows you to succeed. And <clears throat> it's the independence of thought that comes from confidence in your own ability, um, proven to yourself and hopefully not just like made up to yourself uh, that allows you to make these good decisions going forward, whether they're contrarian or not through that whole process, like from buying to holding to selling. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it, and it comes down to skepticism, I think, of the information that's presented to you. It doesn't mean that the information that you either presented to you or you come across, it doesn't mean that that information is wrong, but it means that your first reaction is, uh, let me, let me prove it to myself first, you know, let me, let me um, do research or do, you know, uh, reflect on thought to determine if this information is correct or not. And I think that's a valuable thing to have. It doesn't mean you're always going against the crowd or not, but you know, you're reading a 10K, right? And you're going through some of the commentary or the footnotes and the numbers. Do you blindly accept that as fact or not? And I think if you have more of a contrarian personality, which I agree is a little bit more of an innate quality, then your first reaction is, yeah, that might be true, but you know, let, let's let's figure out if those numbers match up given the other information, you know, out there. Um, and I, I think that's that's almost a crucial thing to have to be a successful investor over the long term to have that initial skepticism. Absolutely. So you know, one note I also took down is that it, investing the the game itself. I mean. It, it, you kind of are naturally a contrarian in some respects, you know, like when you make that decision to buy, that means somebody is making a decision to sell. And when you sell, that means somebody is making the natural decision that they want to buy it. You know, the thought being is that somebody's selling it to you because they don't believe that it's still worth the value in which you're willing to buy it. And you want to sell it because you think it's maximized the value and you're selling it to somebody that thinks there's still some room to run. Right. So keeping, keeping that in mind, I mean, it's still really difficult to develop the thought process on once you've independently figured out, okay, this is an idea maybe that I want to invest in or even short, right? You know, it, it's still getting to that, to that point. So how, I guess I'll throw this out to the panel is, you know, how have you been able to develop that independent mindset so that you've been able to just block out the noise as much as possible, even if you still arrive at what would some, some would argue would be a consensus decision you know, being that there's a lot of people that are looking at this versus, you know, maybe a few people. So who wants to take that, that loaded question first? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do a few, I'll do a few things. Like, I think that some of that yeah. is like behavioral stuff. Um, uh, and like having a journal 
So like I might be exposed to all this bad information. I might be doing bad analysis. Um, but if I follow my process and I like do my pre-mortem in my journal, like that's a way for me to expose some of my own shoddy thinking to myself. And like you put in some sort of mental breaks like that to be so you don't just like drive into the brick wall. Like you give, you try to give yourself a chance to be like, hold on, is this really what I want to do? Um, that's one thing. And I think that another thing is like, I try to fish in ponds with good base rates. Um, mm -hmm. So if I see like directors and executives buying stock, that that tends to be a good thing. If I see that this is a spinoff, that, that tends to be a good thing. So like if this, if I see a situation that fits with my strategy that I have confidence in my own ability to execute on, I feel like I'm in a good base rate pool. And then as long as I follow my, my process, which should have some some like speed bumps in there to keep me from doing something stupid. Those are some ways that I can try to act right. Um, no. You know, I like what Christian said, and the word process comes up a lot in my discussions as well. Um, you have to have a strategy to go out and and find stuff, right? You need a criteria as as a basis to to work from, and if you're disciplined enough you stick to that basis. You're not going to be buying when things are elevated in price. You tend to shy away. You're, you're going to be, you know, um, disciplined in how you look for things or, you know, where you look for things. And, and I think over time you end up building a sort of a subset of tools that will make it easier and faster for you. It becomes a gut reaction after a while. I, I see a lot of really good investors, um, you know, two or three sort of key uh, information points are enough to get them real excited about looking deeper. And if they don't see those two or three things, they just, they don't waste their time. So I, I think it's just a lot of these skill sets are developed over time from trial and error and, and they end up fitting with your personality. I, I think that's the other thing is, you know, the, the personality traits that you guys discuss, you, you just have to be willing to, to do, put in the effort, put in the time to, to find what works for you. Right. And then just keep doing it over and over again. You're going to have good markets, bad markets, you know, all sorts of things. And if you stay dip, disciplined within that, you know, you'll find what works for you. I want to. Sorry, go ahead, Jason. Go ahead. I'm actually going to disagree a little bit with, with maybe some that was just a little earlier that, that some people have this, you know, this natural skepticism or personality that is, that is helpful for, for being a contrarian. I'm not sure you know, how much that really helps. I think a lot of it is just doing the work and going through the process and going deeper uh, that allows you to tune out the noise. Uh, and I think a lot of being a successful contrarian investor is just tuning out the noise. And it's, you know, Buffett mm -hmm. like to say, you, know, you tap dance to work. But I really think you also have to tap dance at work. Uh, and so that you're making your own music, you're listening to your own song and you're just blocking out that, 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 background noise and all those other voices. Um, you know, how much people have, you know, a natural personality, I, I really don't, I, I think a lot of it can be, can be learned and trained. Mm -hmm. But I do think you wanna take what you have from your personality and what you find exciting to look at and what you find exciting to pursue and like your strategy should be aligned with that in, those interests that you have. And those things that you really don't want to do. I mean, you can you can make yourself do some stuff that maybe is on the edge, um, but you don't want to be pushing yourself into things that really just you don't tap dance to do. Um, so it should your strategy and your work should be aligned with what makes you tap dance. I'd say. But I I think I agree with both of you. Um, I think one of the things that makes contrarianism work is the fact that a lot of the 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 things that we do that we individually do we're disciplined at. And that makes you a contrarian because the majority of investors out there, that's the advantages you know, a lot of good investors have is that they're prepared to do the hard work, be disciplined about it, you know, double down and, and take it seriously. We're, we're competing, especially in the micro cap space, we're competing with a lot of retail investors that just don't do the work. So that in its very nature is contrarian. We're, we're you know, it's smaller numbers of, of investors that are doing the real, real hard work and, and you know, spending the time and all that to, to, to find what, you know, what we think are undervalued opportunities. 
Yeah, and like let, let's remember that the vast majority of people, investors are not, have a very short-term mindset, are, are more kind of, uh, let's, let's not as a pejorative, but more lazy in their decision-making mm-hmm. because they're not trained in it. And so when people are just kind of looking at the market, let's call it, say some retail investors are looking at the market for the first time, kind of that's happened in this environment in the last year, we see companies and stocks that are propped up that don't have kind of fundamental long-term uh, potential, you know, that things that we would like to own over the long-term, but they might work for a short-term trade. And then the lessons they're learning, the, the short-term feedback loop they're getting from that is actually making it more and more difficult for them to <laughs> become an actual, you know, in, investor. And so, I mean, I think to Paul's point, uh, simply being uh, disciplined, long-term oriented uh, is like an incredible arbitrage opportunity, <laughs> you know, for us. And that comes from, I think, you know, to disagree with Jason to a degree, uh, I think it comes, a certain amount of that comes from an innate thing. It comes naturally, um, it's personality trait, but, you know, to both agree with part of Jason said as well, it's, we got positive feedback loops from that over time. And that's what caused us collectively um, and individually to appreciate kind of that long-term perspective, which is not the feedback and it's not the approach that a lot of people who've entered the market in the last year have. And it's not the approach that a lot of people who entered the real estate market in 05 had. And it's not the approach that a lot of people who started investing in in internet stocks in 97 had, <laughs> you know? But ours, our approach, I think, is a sustainable multi-decade 50-year approach that we can apply and it's sustainable where the other approaches are not only 50 i hope so how old do you think i am (laughs) (laughs) sorry you look healthy yeah Yeah. so so i don't know that i totally disagree with jason i think that there's a difference between disagreeableness which i which is probably something that's for personal personality makeup and just general skepticism which you learn by getting burned once or twice so you don't need to be born disagreeable to be a skeptic you can just have gotten burned in something once or twice and that'll make you skeptical enough some people some people learn from getting well, i mean the real marks come back again and again right that's so that's how that's how you know who they are uh I don't yeah know. well i mean it goes to kind of what paul was talking about too is some people learn, you know, and uh, whether it's a personality trait that it gives you the capacity and potential to learn from your mistakes or not, <laughs> you know, a lot of people never learn from their mistakes and they certainly don't learn from the mistakes of others. And what you want to do is not only learn from your own mistakes, but, you know, the reason why you read and you have a broad perspective of knowledge is to learn from the mistakes of others. So you don't have to make those mistakes. Uh, but that's, that's not a, that's a unique thing, I think. I still, I still somehow find ways to make those mistakes, though. It's it's funny, you know. As much as I know about, about them, I've uh, made them in just about. We don't want to make the same mistake. Go make a new mistake and learn from that one. Don't these ones all have the same face? face? Like a lot of times, the same yeah. mistake is a different face. You know, it's it's because we're monkeys. Uh, it presents itself differently. You know, even, even it's, it's also best. You know, it's, it's, and some people don't even learn from their own mistakes or other people's mistakes, but uh, a small people. A small group of people actually uh, can learn from other people's successes. It's amazing how many people can't learn from other people's successes, uh, mm-hmm. and that's that's that sometimes differentiates really the best investors. I think you know those are the ones who actually can learn from other people's successes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. The takeaway from this little discussion is that contrarianism is really judgmentalism. Of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually, guys, do you think that, you know, in some ways, the, the term contrarianism, I, mean, I remember, I'm old enough, I'm 48, I remember when everyone used to brag that they were value investors, right? And then there was enough value investors who didn't perform well, and like, nobody wants to be labeled that anymore, right? Right, right. Uh, so I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll end up having, contrarianism is a universal value, right? But the term contrarian, what, there'll be enough crap investors that, that call themselves contrarian that people like us will move on to another term. Uh, in another few years, right? But the underlying values are still always universal and, and hopefully will last forever. I mean, does it really matter unless you're running a fund, right? I mean, you know, like, we, you know, that, that right. does it? Like if you're an individual I, investor and you're- It depends who your investors are. I can tell you that 
like our clients for the most part, you know, growth value, whatever it is. Some people have some concept of like the style boxes, but like at the end of the day, most people just care about whether or not you're doing a good job for them, regardless of how you define it. And, you know, it, you know, it's, you know, is if you go back and like, I like people like to rag on Kathy Wood, but I think she's got a good point that like, you know, on a long enough time frame, a, a good growth stock does become a value stock. It's a good point. I don't necessarily agree with how it gets applied, in, particularly as it relates to the things that she's doing. But it's a mm-hmm. it's a good point. Like it's and people people don't think that way. It's very easy to go out and buy some buy you know something at five times earnings. Or, I, I don't think it's actually that easy. I'm very I've learned I've learned that by making that mistake a bunch of times. But like. You know, some, something that looks like it's at five times earnings than it is to go out and buy something that looks like it's at 30 times earnings. Like, I think the most, the, the one thing that I learned, um, I, uh, not one thing that I learned, but like somebody posted um, a trans, a whole bunch of transcripts online of Joel Greenblatt's special situations class at, at um, Columbia. Everyone here seems to be nodding along like they've, they've read them. Yeah. But the one that like stood out to me the most, and this struck me as a contrarian thing to do. So, I'm bringing it up in the context of being contrarian, but the one class that I got the most out of reading was their decision to buy Moody's, full disclosure, we own Moody's for clients, um, when it was spun out of D&B, full disclosure, we do not own D&B, um, at, at, I forget what the multiple was, it was like 20 times earnings or whatever the hell it was at the time, mm-hmm. right, and they made that analysis and they did analysis. It looked optically expensive and they compared it to the Buffett's decision to buy Coke at what looked like a high multiple at the time. And looking at the successes of those things and like other, other investors who owned optically expensive stocks for a long period of time, but did really well, like, you know, in a way, you know, that's contrarian because everyone was preaching, you know, traditional statistically cheap value. Yep. And, you know, if you go back and look at that, that's a, that's a, that's a contrarian thing to do when most of the market participants are, are, you know, you've got Gene Fama saying statistically cheap value, the guy's got a Nobel prize for the, for the, for the damn thing. And, you know, but these are, these are where people made really, really good amounts of money over time. But and what so year, what year did he buy that? Do you, do you recall what year? I thought it was 2000 or uh, 99, something like, it was whenever the spin happened. I forget the exact year, but I mean, it turns out Buffett was buying alongside of them in, in the spin because he what did he wind up owning 15% of it or something? And I bet he wish he bought the whole damn thing now, but you know, that's I, I don't know if he had enough money at the time or not. Yeah, you know what our, 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 de- our definition of values changed over the years. I've been at this a long time, and you know, the 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 way we're looking at different kinds of businesses now, we're 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 just using the term value differently. I mean, ultimately, we're buying, you know, future revenue stream or future, you know, stream of cash flow. It's it's how we're defining it. I think it's irrelevant whether you call yourself a value investor or not. You're trying to buy something for less than it's going to be worth down the road. And a software company can be a value play if you understand what the dynamics of its future revenue flow is, right? So it's it's all about how you go and value something and then, you know, how you determine the discount to its future value. So. Yeah. And the, the I, future I, value is such a, such a fuzzy yeah. number, right? I mean, it's, it's, sure. Sure. it's like a prediction on a prediction on a prediction. And it's like, there's all kinds of points in the analysis that you can be wrong, but if you're sort of just more or less directionally right on it, it, you, it can work out just fine. You know, it's mm-hmm. one of those things where like the few, it's, I tend to think about it as like, you know, it, it, the traditional value investing was all about the past and more or less today, people are thinking more about the present or the future. And I prefer to think, you know, it's, it's some combination of those two things. And at some, at some point in mind, that, that, that importance, that, that changed. Mm-hmm. I think that that's, that that's something that's interesting here. Like we all want to be right. And that's how you, you make money is by being right. Um, and you can be right with value. You can be right with growth and you can change how all those things are are defined where contrarianism becomes useful is where you're right and very few people agree with you right now and then like you not only get paid for being right you get paid for being right and everybody coming over to your side um and that's that's where we you can get like a heck of a lot more multiple expansion than you would with just like 
being right about Google. If you're right about if you're right about Moody's, you make X. If you're right about Moody's and everybody else is like, I'm a diehard value investor. I care about Ben Graham and book value. Then you make even like two, three times X. Um, so that's. I just want to give like a little fill up to uh, to being a contrarian because it gives you that boost to whatever else you get from being correct on your analysis. Um, and your analysis is like, it's not a static thing that happens when you buy. It happens when you buy and then you observe what happens going forward. Like your growth stock can peter out after five years, but you, you, you keep watching it and evaluate. So, no. But I mean, if you own something for a long enough period of time, it's going to give you often, oftentimes you're going to wind up taking contrarian positions on it. So like, like the ratings agencies are a great example. In 2011, um, owning ratings agencies was a highly contrarian position because it yeah. was like nobody was like, Yes, they should be I abolished. Think, yeah, I know. <laughs> like everybody was like, somebody should get rid of these things. You know, no matter no matter what system. it is, you know, you're going to encounter points of time where you are taking a contrarian position one way or another just by continuing to own something. Um, you know, there's a difference, I think, or maybe there's a difference in, in taking a contrarian position, you know, owning coal companies or something, you know, where you've got a terminal value issue potentially versus, say, something like the ratings agencies where they're more or less ingrained in the system. You know, like and like maybe say, okay, they're these guys are ingrained in the plumbing. They're not going anywhere. There could be a big old fine that they got to pay, but you know, it's worth the risk. You know, and in hindsight, you could say that with perfect information. There are other instances, I'm sure, where you know maybe it wasn't worth the risk to to take that kind of risk. You know, but that's that's where that's where it's all about identifying your point of view. Or there's a lawsuit or something, and you know, you've got a different view of the lawsuit. Or there's a piece of paper on a company's balance sheet that you got a different point of view on than somebody else. Like, you know, I'm involved in a company company right now that has a piece of paper on the balance sheet that I think is, you know, basically equity. And, you know, that's a, that's a contrarian position on the matter. Now there's other issues that have emerged, but, you know, we won't go into those. Yeah, it's, a question, like, um, if, if you don't mind, Gary, um, it's kind of to you, Gary, but good to, for Paul's point earlier, um, like where to fish, you know, to find the best contrarian ideas um, or the best ideas that might appeal to our contrarian nature. How do you go about idea sourcing from this perspective? Yeah, so the search strategy, essentially. So you're, you're just, I think about it as like the search strategy, right? Yeah, do you go, I mean, 52 week lows? Is there something like that? Is there some sort of, um, you know, quantitative financial uh, metrics that you search for? How, how do you go about finding ideas that you think might be off the beaten path or not? Not yeah. So it depends. It depends for what. Like so. Like for what you're in something for. So like, I've done pretty well. I mean, I've done reasonably well in instances where there's like a reorg and there's something going on there. And um, you know, I've got a different point of view about some contingent liability or something like that. Um, there was a, a well-known case with a uh auto parts supplier where there was a liability that was shoved on them that we did all right on and like 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 so we're it's places like that um you know um uh spinoffs were mentioned occasionally i'll look at those um i would say that with those the bigger companies got really expert at just offloading garbage honey um, yeah <laughs> yeah so like you've got to be pretty skeptical of that um, but anytime I see like a micro cap spinoff, I always take a look because it's always interesting to me when you see something like that, because then the, it, it, it always appears to me like the insiders are lining up to do something. Um, rights offerings, you know, whenever there's a, a particularly one that's fully backstopped and, and like that's usually like there are just places to look and fish where there's like it doesn't mean you're always going to find something. And I would say that personally, like if it's my idea. I am good at, I, like, a, with that kind of stuff, I can find four to six things that are truly worth doing in a given year. Like, and that's a good year. Um, and I might hear four or six things from the dozen or so other people that I talk to that are worth looking at or doing that maybe, aren't, that maybe didn't originate with me. Um, and that's sort of how I go about it. Um, you know, everybody's a, a little different in that regard. So I'd be curious to hear other people's takes on the search strategy for looking for either, I mean, the controversial stuff, you know, 52 week low is sure. The, the sort of things that nobody else has any opinion on, but that's a different matter too. So, um, you know, in a big bull market, sort of that's trolling the 52 week low list, I think you gotta be pretty skeptical of the stuff that's on the 52 week low list this far into a bull market because it's really, 
truly got some, it, it, it more likely than not had truly has some problems with it. Unless of course it's like, you know, there's some known issue that you that you have a different opinion on. And that, that may, be a, may be the only opportunity I think that, that lies on the fixed well, that's, that's at this point at this point in the cycle. There are other points in the cycle where, you know, 15 months ago, everything was on the 52 week low list. And a contrarian position was simply just being able to step up and put your money to work. So, um, you know, it really just depends, I guess. I, can, do you mind if we pose that same question to everybody? I mean, no, that's why I stopped. I want to hear whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, look, I can answer for Paul, and he just reads every CDAR filing that's a non <laughs> for a non resource company. So, I, I but uh, I've I tried that, and it drives me insane. Oh, I, <laughs> I, I am insane. Great job, Paul. It's, it's, <laughs> it's too late for me. Uh, no, I, no, I mean, um. I mean, everybody, everybody at this table right now, I know they have their own edge, right? You, you got to go and develop an edge to, to get good at this stuff. And, and I've always, you know, been crazy enough to, to do that because I, I found enough gems, you know, doing that process and it fits sort of my, my personality, I guess, to find something and, and be prepared to, to hunt it when nobody else is looking at it. So yeah, you know, we, and we manually search the CEDAR filing. So we don't use any software because the odd one that slips through the software program is the one that's even sort of a more contrarian uh, opportunity. Um, you know, the, you know, one of my best stocks that I'd known, you know, Jason did well on as well, that did not show up in a software program. So it, it, you know, f to find it, you had to go and look where nobody else was looking. And, and, you know, CDAR filings for us um, give us the fundamental stuff that we're looking for. You know, I mean, there's a lot more work that goes into it afterwards, but, you know, it, it tosses up enough gems where we know that uh, it's such a tedious process to go through that we know that we've got a competitive advantage over everybody else that's just not prepared to do the work. So that's kind of, that's where we start. Is there a better um, interface to look at CDR filings and CDR itself? Is there like a better? <laughs> no, and, and I don't want it to ever change. I, <laughs> I want it to be as nasty and ugly as it is now. Um, it is, God, I, I've got to send whoever developed that software, I'm going to send them a Christmas gift basket every year because it <laughs> is. got to do a capture to open it though. Like, you got to make it hard. <laughs> it's nasty. Yeah. So, then, yeah, so it's pretty. So no, Pretty so rough. Note, I mean, note, note to every information provider: just make sure it's it's just a horrible search engine. You know, that's the only way. That's the only way that Paul will use. It. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Jason, Jason, how about you? You know what? I mean, I, I, just, I, I think it changes a little bit as you as you get further into investing. I think in, in, in when you're younger, you may focus a lot more on screens. Uh, as you develop, a, you know, you get a little more into investing. You, you know, meet more people. Uh, you really start relying on your sort of friends network, right? Uh, and that's what really I rely on these days. You know, people who I share ideas, you know, the one or two that I may have a year, you know, they share their ideas with me. Uh, I may like, you know, a, a few of them. Uh, and that's really how I get my, my ideas this, this point in time. You tend to develop, you know, there's, there's a number of friends out there when they mention a stock, you know, you, you're like, you just sit up straight and listen, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Uh, because you, you sort of trust, uh, you may not invest in it, you know, in fact, you may even tell them if, if you're a good friend, you'll tell them why you don't like it if you don't like it. Um, but uh, you, you certainly want to, to listen to them because you respect their thought process and you respect you know, their past results. So that's that's my uh, um, that's that's the way I find ideas these days. Gotcha. How about you, Christian? Um, specific to contrarian sort of ideas that are unpopular um, to anecdotes type things that I do are if something is made fun of on Twitter and the jokes are funny, um, then I feel like I should pay attention because maybe like if if it's gone on so long that you can make a funny joke about it and many people do, then maybe there's something there. Um, <laughs> and also if like, if this was a stock that was in the news several years ago, so like everybody knows the story, I and I see anything about it, I it like, maybe I should take a look at this because maybe the story has changed. I'd say like St. Joe would be an example of that where it's like, this was just like known several years ago and Berkowitz was in it and it was just like, 
his like march into Russia that was just a disaster for him. And then like, wait a second, maybe some things are happening now. And like AT&T, people recently have made fun of AT&T and it was like, I have to look at it. And like, I couldn't get there, but it's just like, people say that they've got the worst capital allocation ever. Um, they're doing the stupid deal and Malone is screwing them again. Like, I don't know, just th that's like anecdotal things that like perk me up for, a, maybe this is a contrarian idea. More useful stuff is, like Gary said, spinoffs, like I'm a spinoff guy. I like looking at them. And I think that in some cases you will have, like it takes a year to do with most spinoffs unless it's a tiny company and they got all their act together. Um, so it's like, this is a corporate division that they have been annoyed with for long enough that they decided at the board level to get rid of it. And then it took a whole year. And now finally it's coming out. Like in some cases you can get some things that are very unpopular um, and have just been shunted out maybe at a good time. Um, so sometimes spin-offs can be useful for a contrarian idea. And the other thing is, uh, like I mentioned before, director and executive buys. Like, so if you get a number of these things working together, like at at and the CEO and the CFO bought stock, like if I see a, a bunch of these sort of things happening together, um, I'm like, well, maybe this is interesting and maybe everybody hates it or knows the story, even though that story is outdated. And um, that can be interesting for being right and contrarian. Um, so. Yeah, but it's not enough just to be like, like, like contrarian on that front, because like, like those, are, those are all good things. But I asked myself an additional question, like what's gonna actually make it go up? Like what's gonna make people, you know, like- Who's gonna buy it from me? Yes. Yeah, and that's yeah. not even necessarily like a catalyst per se. It's just like, that could just be like, things are getting better, you know, like, and like you get like as a contrarian you really have to have the answer to that question because you could be sitting there with something for a long time and like time is an opportunity cost too if it's not going anywhere and yep. i don't know about you guys but i've all i've been stuck in things that haven't gone anywhere for a few years and it's always maybe you guys are just better than me at this stuff but um, you know, the things you're stuck in the things you're stuck in do they have like very good underlying economics or are they like mediocre companies that are just like priced to trash I think they're always the cut to companies where something just kind of happens to them and they sort of get stuck there. Uh, okay. You know, so like if they don't control, like, the, the, and like, I've, I've actually tried to avoid that more or less over time. So like, I don't know that I have anything today that I would say I'm necessarily quote unquote stuck in. Um, but I've also evolved over time where like, maybe I can help be influential in what happens with the company and, you know, sort of help them. Like, I don't, we don't do any activist stuff, but like, we'll talk to management, and, you know, suggestions ideas and what have you but i've heard the um, term su suggestivist so you're a suggestivist <laughs> to an extent to the extent that like you know my opinion is useful like i don't have an inflated sense of what my my opinion is but i, I do find that a lot of times these guys you know like they they, they 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 run their business and that's all they know they're not really you know capital markets guys necessarily per se and so maybe there's things to think about or or, or, or do or whatever um but yes, uh, okay, uh, you know, but I, I have, you know, it's it's more or less being better at like sort of just cut, cutting the cord when something's not quite going right and something never seems to be going right. It's you've got to get better at that. But like what I've learned to ask myself at the beginning is, you know, are things getting better? Or are they getting worse? Or are they staying the same? And can I tell? And, you know, if the answer to the question is worse, well, then I, I, I it's a clear stay away. And if it's the same, well, how confident am I on that? And if it's getting better, well, I oftentimes will feel mu I, I will oftentimes feel pretty good about that as if as the obvious things are, are in the midst of getting better, um, and that it just in fact it affects my confidence level and being able to sort of stick with something. But that's not that's a learning over time that you had to ask yourself that because you know a lot of these things can be a lot of contrarian plays can be death by a thousand cuts. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Hey Stephen, so you asked the question. What about you? Where, where yeah, that's, you? That's not how it works, though. Yes, the <laughs> answer. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, you know, it's similar to uh, to to across the board here. I think what I like to do is uh, go to the original sources. So I, I maybe this is part of the skepticism slash contrarianism part of it that you don't really want to hear um, other opinions until later, and uh, so even. But that, that being said, I still do appreciate and rely on the network. Um, it's just that I, you know, when I kind of hear an idea from the network, I'll just set it down and deal with it later. You know, I'm not, I'm kind of, it's like, okay, a smart, smart person, 
uh, is in this company. They really like it. Um, I, I appreciate that, but let me go decide if I like it later. So I'll set it down for a few days and take a look. But that, that is one way to do it. But then wh what will I take a look at? I won't take a look at their opinion first. <laughs> I mean, they've already kind of given their opinion to present the idea. Um, I don't really want to hear why they like it. I just want to hear that they do. And then I'll go to the filings. I'll go to the original sources. Uh, you know, so so first the SEC stuff or, or you know, Canadian company or UK company or whatever the case may be, go to the original filings, go to the financials, go to some historical information there, and then go to, you know, if the company has some press releases or, or you know, investor presentations or commentary, which I'm more skeptical of, um, but to see if I'm missing any information, you know, that they're providing. Um, yeah, and then from there, I might read some some kind of research reports or opinions online or something like that. But in terms of coming across those things, look, I have SEC alerts set up uh, for, uh, you know, types of filings. And I'll kind of scroll through those types of filings. I have alerts set up, Google alerts set up for uh, keyword terms. Uh, and then, you know, when you have a watch list, you just kind of have, you know, there's a Twitter, Twitter search for that, you know, ticker symbol and, you know, put little different news alerts set up and things like that. And so, you know, at some point though, and I think all of us have this, you're, you're far enough in your career and your investing career that you have a huge watch list of things and companies you've recognized from decades ago that, you know, you'll just occasionally come across and see what happened recently. And, you know, Christian had a good point. St. Joe's is, is, a, is an excellent example because the story has changed significantly. And it's a story that probably most of us were familiar with to a degree 15 years ago. <laughs> and it's a, or 12 years ago, or however, when, when Berkowitz first got into it. And it's a different company now. And, and it's kind of something that, okay, it pops back up on your radar screen eight years later oh, I wonder what's going on there. Oh, it's different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you build up that knowledge of companies and industries, um, things like that. But in terms of a kind of original idea sourcing, I go to, to the original sources and the filings. And, you know, I, to a degree with Paul, like I don't, I don't get into the Canadian companies as much, but what I will do sometimes is just scroll through every kind of OTC or as many as possible, just kind of the OTC filings that are non-SEC filing companies. And you can go through those fairly quickly and, you know, you can knock out a, however many a day, how much time you have, just kind of scroll through and you find a needle in a haystack once a year, you make a lot of money from it. All right. So for my final question, before we let everybody go today, I want to get your best contrarian take based on the current market conditions right now. This is not me asking for your best stock idea or anything, but just your best contrarian take you know based on news or information that you've you've seen out there so who wants to go first with that one or do we should we take it should we take a five second pause no, we'll all right i got i've got something yeah, for you i'll be in the can okay. <laughs> I've, I've got something for you all right here we go let's go my my controversial slash contrarian take is that some of these wall street bet people that are resuscitating companies are correct so the AMC investors, the, um, the, uh, you know, the Hertz <laughs> investors, the GameStop investors, even Tesla, Tesla was kind of the original one to this. I'm not saying I'm, I want to invest in any of this, but these people were made themselves right from sheer force and willpower mm -hmm. because <laughs> by propping up the stock price and having such high volume over an extended time period, it allowed these companies, you know, certain the, the executives who are smart about it to go raise money off of them. <laughs> and it actually has saved, saved these companies. Still not a good investment though, <laughs> but it was right in the sense that it saved the companies and what is in the best interest, right? Is it the best interest of the investors of the company or should an executive act in the best interest of the company itself? So raising money at inflated prices certainly takes advantage of these retail investors, but it is in the best interest of the company itself. So that would be my contrarian take is that these retail investors, while shooting themselves in the foot, have done an excellent service <laughs> to the long-term viability of the companies themselves. That's, that's, a, that's a good that's, take. Yeah, that's, that's, cool. a, that's a good one. 
All right, who, who, it's collective wanna... suicide, like you know, in that degree that they've <laughs> they saved the country by shooting themselves all in the head. Uh, <laughs> I think interestingly enough, I'm not sure that we've seen how crazy it can get yet. I think we've seen a lot of crazy. Um, I still think there's crazy left to go before we before we wash this all out. So um, the AMC stuff and the GameStop stuff is crazy, but it's fairly localized to like a handful of names. Um, the SPAC stuff was kind of crazy. I just don't see it as a pervasive thing. I know I don't know I don't know if that's a contrarian take or not, but um, I don't think we've seen how crazy it can get in this cycle yet. I think that's a good contrarian take because some people probably would think that it it has gone crazy. So to say that there's still room for more crazy. Yeah, everyone everyone that come in everybody that comes in and talks to me and tries to sell me stuff tells me to buy that, that we should be buying commodities and doing all this other stuff. And it's like, you know, the easier the easier that is to sell to somebody like that sits in my my chair, like the more skeptical of it I am. Got it. All right. So between Christian, Jason, and Paul, who wants to who wants to give their best contrarian take next? I got nothing. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm struggling uh, as far as I, you know, I, it, it's um, I'm going to go back to more personality traits. It, it, it seems to have gotten so easy to make money in the market that I think uh, discipline is, is sort of not in vogue right now. It's just, you know, let, let's go jump on this fad or jump on that fad. And I think that maybe that's always been around, but I think um, it, it's just, it's, you know, double down on what works historically. Right. I think, you know, uh, emphasize a strategy and be disciplined about it, C continue to validate it, do it over and over again. Um, you know, sometimes I sit there and I watch what I thought was crazy things happen. And, you know, some of these meme stocks and things like that. I, I don't know if that can be repeatable over and over again, right? Um, it just, I, I think it's, it's a little too easy. It's a little too, you don't have to do as much work as, as you should to be able to get long-term consistent results. I think the contrarian play right now is be more disciplined than you know, you've had to be in the last few years and you know, validate your information. Um, be, be uncomfortable in some of the positions you're taking on, but make sure you're, you're doing the work and and be yeah do the work that's <laughs> there's your contrarian uh, uh idea here be, be I, diligent I feel, and do the work i feel like and that will be paul's stock answer the next time like you know let's say markets turn that's going to be his contrarian take to just be disciplined you know what even <laughs> like that's such a good that's such a good contrarian take just for a man for all markets you know just I'm, I'm the, I, I think i'm the oldest guy here i'm allowed to say that because i've done all the mistakes <laughs> everybody else uh, has been making lately i i've done them all so i can i can afford to to say that now yeah. <laughs> fair enough all right jason so you can't say that your contrarian take is that the knights will win Okay, so we need a real. I mean, it's, it's, it's honestly, I just, I'm just, uh, I, it's, I'm struggling to come up with an idea. I'm, I'm probably the same age as Paul, so I'm also that grumpy uh, Bill Belichick, do your job, uh, you know, approach to life, and and you know, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't really know if there's there's there's, you know, sometimes there's there's really no reason to be really out there and make a contrarian take. On, on something that you don't have like an I, I can like an like an expertise on, right? So I'm reluctant to, you know, to to make any kind of predictions on something that I'm really not, you know, you shouldn't take it to the bank. And you got to know your edge, right? And and making big calls is not your edge. So my contrarian take is that I'm not I'm not gonna answer your damn question. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I'll go with the old guys, like uh, yeah, <laughs> Kipling, and when all about them are losing their head, you just try to do the work. Uh, yeah. yeah. I love it, Jason. That. Yeah, Jason, that, that was the greatest answer ever. Sorry, everybody. Your answers were all good, but that was the greatest answer ever. <laughs> uh, that was my dream, actually, of being a host one day, is telling me, tell somebody, having somebody tell me, go, go shove your question uh, up your you-know-what. <laughs> so uh, with that, that's a great place to end it. Um, so... Uh, everybody would love to get where people can go and follow you on social media as well as your website. So uh, from my screen, I'm going to go counterclockwise. So Paul, let's start with you. Uh, you can find out what I do at smallcapdiscoveries.com. All right. There where can go. people follow you on social? 
What's your Twitter? Oh, I, I, I think it's at Paul Andreola. I, I think that's my that's Twitter it. handle. I don't even know. I, <laughs> no, no, that, that's it. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah. There you go. All right, Jason, where can people go and follow you? Uh, on Twitter, it's at track, E-I-G-A-T, track180.com. Uh, no, whatever it is. I, I'm so old, I don't even know you how to like say it. in your Twitter handle? Jason, you're like me. You're like me, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, I don't want you to follow me anyway. Ah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Twitter. Uh, <laughs> Christian, uh, where can people go and follow you and your, and your website? It, it's Kareem Capital, C-U-R-R-E-E-N, and then Capital. That's a website, or you can look for that on uh, Twitter. Um, I don't post much, but uh, it's all gold. No, it's not. It's just trash. <laughs> <laughs> Get, all right, well, we got to get you. We get we got to get you some more content up there. So we, we we need we need we need more. I it's it's like a distraction for me, um, and I'm addicted to it. So I I don't know if I need more of it. So <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. All right, Gary, where can people go and uh, follow? Well, you tell me what how you want to uh, 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 people to go and follow you. I don't know. Uh, oh, it's on nice. the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I got a website. Go uh, listen. All right, I'll do it for you. Your network that occasionally Eric and I do. Yes. All right, I'll do it for you. You can listen to Gary and Eric's podcast in the market trenches. Podbean.com or wherever you get podcasts. And uh, Gary and Eric are the best. All right, Stephen, where can people go and uh, follow you on social and uh, your website as well? This is why they're producers for these podcasts because they, <laughs> they need to promote the hosts. <laughs> Explain the hosts how to promote themselves. <laughs> I'm not promotional. <laughs> That's the contrarian view is don't listen to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's just a waste. If you're going to do it, do it at 3x speed on Spotify because it's uh, yeah. You'll get, you'll get through it in about five minutes. It'll be better, better use of time. <laughs> but then the one person that does listen to it is the one who gets the stock idea that, you know, basically makes them the money to retire right. on. You have to <laughs> cut through it. Anyway, you can find uh, me at uh, arquitos.com, A-R-Q-U-I-T-O-S, uh, willowoakfunds.com uh, also. And uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, Stephen underscore Keel, K-I-E-L. You know, Steve, you you haven't promoted your clubhouse profile. So is clubhouse. Yeah. Done? Sorry, this could be this could go on another rabbit hole. This is where it goes from growth back to value, I guess. That we were talking about it here. <laughs> hey, but you're doing clubhouse and not Twitter Spaces. I mean, Twitter Spaces is where all FinTwit lives. I thought. Yeah, Spaces is where it's at now. It ain't Clubhouse. Yeah. I don't think. I don't know. I deleted the app a while ago. Did you? Okay. Yeah. But you got to be on Spaces. If you did a Spaces, I, I we totally hop on. We do this in real time with others. Be I awesome. Know. I've been. I was thinking about doing. I'll, I might do one soon, you know. But uh, Bobby, gotta, you got to host one. We'll do it. I got I, I'm going to call it for full disclosure. Just make it a whole new, a whole new uh, uh, name. But uh, with that, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. This was a lot of fun. I hope everybody listening learned a little bit more about uh, how you can be a contrarian too, and um, and uh, really do appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Bobby. Take care, guys. Take care, Bobby. Bye.